have to talk about this. This was my birthday gift to myself. Okay, this was my birthday gift to myself. I am so unbelievably excited because I have had the damnedest time finding these Funko Pops. And I'm, I'm really mad because the Crowley one is like anywhere between 67 to like a hundred bucks. And then the other one, there's like a special version where they're both together and they both have their wings. And that one is like anywhere between 160 to 300 bucks. So I'm like, I can't even, I'm so devastated. I kind of hate like aftermarket resale shit for this reason, because if something's even remotely popular still, it's going to be ridiculously expensive, but I was able to get a zero fail. So he is going to be, I don't know where I'm going to put him right now. I'm wondering if he can stand up on his own. Cause I have some of these, like one of my funk, I don't have many Funkos, but one of my Funkos that's Alaska, her hair is so big. She cannot stand up on her own. And even Trixie can barely stand up on her own. She's so like top heavy in the head. So I'm kind of tempted to just leave him in the box for now, even though I really don't like to. And when I first got him, I, I don't know if I still, oh yeah. When I first got him, because he came from like a collectible place, they put him in like this extra cellophane crap. And I'm like, that's going to catch the light and be really annoying to look at. Like, no. So sorry if anyone thought I was like buying this as like a whole big collectible thing so I can resell it for tons of money later. Like, no, I want this for me. He's going to be right here for now. Um, I don't know. I haven't decided where I'm going to put him. I may start rearranging some of this shit just because I'm kind of bored with the way things are right now. Like this background, there's a lot. What's unfortunate is like, there is so much more to all of this that you can't see. And I've debated like pushing the camera back, but then there's like all of my desk here where I have my makeup that is like a clusterfuck nightmare. And so I don't want that in frame. <laughs> so it's like trying to figure out how you want to do this. But I do wish there was more of this that was visible because there's so much cute stuff that's like visible in some videos, but then not in other videos. So it's really frustrating. And of course, you know, I went to all this trouble to paint everything and then you can't even see it in like 90% of the videos, except for like, you know, three square inches above my head. So it's really kind of annoying. Uh, I do have my little angel boy, so I'm not that mad about it, but I wish I had Crowley too. Cause I feel like they're a set like should not be separated, should be like on the box. You can't separate those two. It's just not right, but we're going to deal with it. So yes, I just wanted to say welcome to another Good Omens video. I almost feel a tiny bit bad for anybody who followed my account pre my resurgence of a Good Omens obsession, because I know that you weren't like expecting this to completely take over. I wasn't entirely either to be fair. So like we're both in the same boat there, but this is like completely taken over my life, my mind. I'm not mad about it. So, but if you are, I'm so sorry. Um, I will not blame anyone for unfollowing who was not expecting all the Good Omens content, but for anyone who is a new person who followed me specifically for my Good Omens content. Thank you so much for joining me. Really, really appreciate it. I am making new videos every Tuesday and it's gonna be Good Omens content for the foreseeable future. Quick side note. So this has become news like literally as I'm filming this today. I normally film this like on Saturdays, but I don't know what happened Saturday or Sunday. So here we are on Monday night, the day before I post, there has been a new breaking development. There is a tentative WGA contract agreement. So congratulations. Very excited about that. I do believe that the Screen Actors Guild is still not reached their agreement yet. There's still a lot of things that, you know, and a tentative agreement doesn't necessarily mean that everything is going to be signed on the dot. As far as I understand it, like from what I read of the message, there are still kind of like, you know, everything actually has to be written up and signed, but a tentative agreement does seem like a good thing. So I'm very, very pleased with that. I do hope that that means that the Writers Guild and eventually SAG as well will get what they're asking for. And again, you know, I say that as someone who 
is a writer myself who has wanted to write for television for years, I am someone who I'm a firm believer that we need to take care of people, especially creative people. We need to appreciate them more. So I'm glad that there is this tentative agreement. And it sounds like the WGA is getting what was asked for. So I hope that's the case. And I hope that when everything ultimately ends up being signed, that they will get everything that they asked for and that uh, everything will continue with the Screen Actors Guild as well, because I think that's only going to be a good thing for everyone involved. I'm your host, Not For Possession, Narcissa DeVille, and welcome to hell. So this is not going to be a comprehensive list. This is not me thinking at all that I am going to touch over every single theme and symbol and all of that that comes up in the show. And I decided to do themes and symbols because I was originally just going to do like the symbolism part, but I do feel like sometimes themes and symbols kind of like intermingle and I feel like when I was writing the list it was kind of some things were a little more themey and some things were a little more symbolism so I just kind of wanted to combine the two and just talk about themes and symbols let's get into it so I am doing this by the way just so we know I'm going to be doing this kind of in a uh, I call it a Jenny Nicholson style numbered list. I'm a huge fan of hers. If you don't know who she is, I highly recommend you look her up. I think she's absolutely hysterical. She's done so many like incredible videos, but a lot of her videos, she always kind of talks about the numbered list of like things that if she has like points, point by point list of like things that she wants to talk about. And so I wanted to do this video in that same vein as like a sort of numbered list. So the first kind of theme and symbol that I wanted to talk about is the color yellow specifically. Now we see throughout season two in particular that yellow is a big kind of like symbolic thing, but also like a theme specific thing. Like if you notice in the bookshop in sort of the back room, uh, Aziraphale's walls are yellow. You know, he turns the Bentley yellow and says that it's a very pretty color. Of course, yellow is reminiscent of Crowley's eyes. And so I started to kind of look into this and try and figure out what does the color yellow symbolize? Like, what does that mean? What is the significance of this? Like, obviously to me, you know, the biggest symbol is like, he thinks it's pretty because it reminds him of Crowley's eyes. And I think that's very cute and romantic and sweet. But I did kind of want to delve a little bit deeper because as I've said throughout like previous videos, and as I kind of said, specifically in the queer historical significance video, it's very, very evident that you know, things are a little bit deeper than how they first appear on the surface. So yes, obviously saying that yellow is a pretty color is very representative of Aziraphale's love and affection for Crowley, but I do think there's a little bit more something there. So I decided to look it up and I wanted to know kind of the historical significance of yellow. So in the early, early days of art history, we do see yellow being used to represent gods and deities because, of course, yellow represents sunshine and represents, you know, that kind of golden, beautiful, you know, just kind of gives you deity, right? But as time goes on, and specifically in more Christian and Catholic art, we see that yellow starts to take on a different meaning. Yellow becomes more commonly associated with Judas Iscariot, and it becomes known as sort of a representative deceit, and it becomes known with, you know, lies and secrecy and things like that. And so it's interesting because there's this big dichotomy, of, and I think they come up quite a bit if you think about the season, because yes, in, on the one hand, you know, lies and deceit, Aziraphale is lying to heaven and lying to God in, in a very real sense, not just about his feelings for Crowley, but also he's lying about, you know, what he's doing and, you know, about the flaming sword. And he's lying about, you know, if you go back to the Job situation, he lies about that they killed Job's kids. So there's all these little things where it's the deceit of heaven. But I also think in a lot of ways, you could take it to an even more metaphorical sense, talking about how heaven is often lying to Aziraphale. We have obviously the Metatron, who's very clearly manipulating and lying to Aziraphale to get what he wants. Because I think if we're honest with ourselves, and especially, you know, bringing this back to Crowley again, 
I think the Metatron knows that he can get Aziraphale to agree to, agree to almost anything if he uses Crowley as some kind of bargaining chip. And I think we all can agree that there is no way in hell that Crowley was ever going to be made an angel, even if that's something the Metatron could do. Nobody in heaven would ever accept him as an angel, number one. But number two, I don't think, like, you know, if you're cast out by God specifically, and that's kind of the the mythology, as I recall it, from the Bible, I don't think any angel is going to have the authority to undo that. So the Metatron or I should say Aziraphale as Supreme Archangel, does not have the authority to do that. And so the Metatron even saying that is clearly like, you're full of shit, dude. Like, it's just not going to happen. And so I think there's all these kind of like underlying things where yellow is very representative of the deceit of heaven, both, you know, in terms of Aziraphale's own deceit, of heaven, but also their deceit of him. You know, they're constantly lying to him and manipulating him. You also have to look at it as the area in which these walls are yellow, because it's very specifically in his back room, and one could also call it his inner sanctum. So it's the innermost parts of Aziraphale's mind where he feels the most, you know, protected maybe that's where he's got this yellow which of course you know like I said bringing it back to representing Crowley so it's just this level of you know again it's the levels that go into this show it's the levels that go into each and every kind of moment symbols are abound but they're also you know some of them are a little more obvious and some of them are not as obvious. And I think that's very, very interesting. So number two is I think really, really on the surface, talking about goats is really, really silly. But I noticed throughout season two, and actually if you go back into season one, it comes up again. But I noticed in season two, Crowley has a very specific affinity for goats. Like you see it mentioned in Job where he starts off the scene, you know, you think he's talking to a person, but actually he's talking to goats and talking about how, you know, this God that you love wants you to die. And then we see later in the season or later in the episode, Crowley is talking about how God wants him to whack the kids, kid being another word for goat, which is interesting because you could say, oh, it's talking about Job's children, but really everyone uses the word children, including Crowley, except in that moment where he's talking about the goats again. You know, he talks about the goats in another moment. He saves the goats from being slaughtered by turning them into pigeons, I think, or some kind of bird. So it's this really interesting theme where goats keep coming up. And then there's another episode where when Crowley is drunk off laudanum, he makes this like braying sound and goes, oh, I think that kind of sounds like a goat, which is the cutest moment I've like, I can't even get into it. It's so cute. But anyway, so it's another moment where he's talking about goats. And then in, if you go back to season one, we see a scene where it's, no, you know, during the Noah's Ark scene, you see children running around, but you also see goats. And Crowley says the line again, you can't kill kids. And it sounds like he's talking about children, but very clearly it seems to me that he's talking about goats and children, I think, because Neil has already said that Crowley his favorite animal is clearly children. Uh, actually, he said specifically kids. It seems to me you could kind of take that either as actual children or goats. But it is really interesting that like, at least at the time when Job was said, kid wouldn't have been the typical way of talking about children. That's probably something that was saved for goat, like young goats. And so I decided to look in, okay, what is the symbolism of goats? Why does this keep coming up? Why is this something that keeps happening? And especially specifically with Crowley. And so of course, the interesting thing is that the symbolism of goats is kind of exactly what you would think. It's a symbol of sacrifice to usually dark spirits and demons. You know, a lot of popular media includes sacrificing goats to, you know, some kind of demon or, you know, Satan. You know, there's so many instances where a goat is symbolic of, you know, 
demonic rituals. So it's kind of appropriate that Crowley being a demon would actually be kind of obsessed with goats, but also specifically protecting goats and keeping them safe and not wanting to see them sacrificed. And it's kind of like this inversion of expectations as a demon that he doesn't want to see this goat sacrificed and he doesn't want to see these goats killed or harmed. And it's really kind of sweet. And it is kind of interesting too, that like, you know, so the the symbology of goats is like sacrificing to evil but in a, a weird inversion again there is god who made this deal with satan and you know it's that joke about sealing the deal with hand and hoof which of course is you know the idea that satan has hooves there's this idea of now crowley being a demon being requested to sacrifice these goats as part of the deal with God, and he can't do it. Number three, of course, we have to talk about apples because, you know, I think if you know anything, like even if you don't know the Bible, you know that the apple is considered the forbidden fruit um, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so I feel like apples kind of are just the most obvious symbol and probably could have been number one, but it honestly was not the first one I thought about because I had already kind of thought about the color yellow and all that symbolism prior to this. But apples, I think, you know, if you look at it from the forbidden fruit angle, they obviously come up in season one in the Garden of Eden. It comes up again as Adam is, you know, taking apples from someone else's garden. So of course, you know, apples have that whole symbolism. They represent the knowledge of good and evil, and they also represent that forbidden fruit. But in this, in season two, apples don't necessarily play as big of a role, but someone did point something out that I think is very, very interesting. And if it's true, I'm going to have to rewatch this. So someone has pointed out that in the shot of Xerophil and the Metatron at the coffee shop when the Metatron is telling Aziraphale kind of all of his, you know, that he can be an angel and that Crowley can be an angel too. There is actually behind Aziraphale an apple tree that is kind of like making its way towards him almost. And I think if that's true, that is such an interesting little moment because it then presents this idea again of the forbidden fruit because they're bringing up, it, it makes Crowley literally the forbidden fruit, which I'm not touching that. We're not touching that. Don't, don't. But <laughs> in, a, in a literal sense as like, he's the forbidden fruit of like, he gave the forbidden fruit and he had the knowledge and he passed that on to humans, but also the forbidden fruit in the sense of their friendship and their relationship and their love, which is very clearly what it is, is forbidden. And so I think the apple metaphor is even more apt in this case, because it's that very, very forbidden moment. And again, that goes back to the color yellow thing too, is it's like, clearly the Metatron is deceiving him. Clearly there is knowledge to be gained there if he's willing to go for it. And if Crowley is the representative forbidden fruit in terms of he is the one with the knowledge about heaven, clearly, and he even says as much when he says, I think I know more about it than you do, but he also is the knowledge of, you know, you can have what you've always wanted. You don't have to try and be who heaven is trying to make you out to be. You can be your own person. Number four is maybe a little bit of a stretch. You can all tell me how you feel about this idea. But one of the things I thought about as like a sort of like symbolic moment. So if you look at the kiss, everyone, you know, Neil has very clearly said that that kiss was not meant to be a romantic thing. They already, you know, we already know how they feel about each other. We already know that they love each other. That was not the point of that kiss. The point of that kiss was a last ditch effort by Crowley to make Aziraphale see reality. It was sort of the you know, forcing his hand to bite the apple as it were. And so I think if you take that, it feels very like, you know, if you think about the old school Disney movies and you think about the idea of like 
true love's kiss waking up the princess at the end of like Sleeping Beauty. The idea was it was an attempt on Crowley's part to wake Aziraphale up to the truth that heaven is not the best place for him. It is not where he belongs. He belongs on earth with Crowley because they are meant to be together. They clearly love each other. They've loved each other for years. I think since the beginning, but I'm sure, you know, they didn't recognize it until a little bit later. But, you know, clearly he is trying to wake him up to the idea that this is not, you know, you don't belong in heaven. You don't belong with the angels and the Metatron because they, first of all, they don't even fucking care about you like that. But it clearly, and for a moment too, if you watch it, almost works. There's a moment where obviously, you know, you can see Aziraphale kissing back. You can see him kind of grabbing onto Crowley and not wanting to let go. But there's a moment where when the Metatron returns, at least a few different times, Aziraphale backs away and you almost think he's like seen the light. You know, he's tasted the forbidden fruit quite literally. He has that knowledge. And so he's like, looking like he's going to refuse. He's looking like he is so close to not going with the Metatron. It's, there's at least, someone counted out that there's at least eight moments probably where Aziraphale looks back to where Crowley is. So there's at least eight moments where he second guesses and doubts and wonders and it's so close that you think he's not going to leave. I was reminded of if you've ever watched the original, like, first couple seasons of Grey's Anatomy, there is this line that Meredith says that has literally stuck with me my entire life. I will never stop thinking about it. And it's when she is talking to uh, Dr. Shepard because he's considering going back to Addison, who I love, by the way. But anyway, he's thinking about going back to Addison and she, you know, Meredith basically gives him an ultimatum and she says, pick me, choose me, love me. And I feel like in his way, Crowley isn't going to say that, but in his way, that kiss is him saying that. That is him saying, pick me, choose me, choose our love and choose earth. That is what he is asking. And it like adds this other layer and dimension to it. That's just like, again, it's so fucking heartbreaking. Why do you hurt me like this? And I know that it's like, I, I have to believe that Neil is going to make this right in the third season. And hopefully we will get that third season sooner than previously expected. Number four. Uh, I find it very, very interesting because really, so there's, there's the nightingale and there's the lark, right? So there's the nightingale who is a bird who sings its love song to its mate in dark, in the dark, in secret, you know, very much under the cover of night. That's how it creates that sound. It's also considered one of the most beautiful sounds known to man as far as like the, the way they trill. And I think I read something like they have over a hundred different kind of sounds that they make, which I found really interesting. But you know, they, they very much make those sounds of their love at night. It's very much, you know, under cover of darkness, hidden away. And I think that's appropriate, obviously, for these two where their love is very, very obvious, but can't really be said. Whereas there is the lark, who is a bird who sings its beautiful love song during the day and in the bright lights of, you know, daylight and daytime. And so, you know, of course, you've got the the Nightingale sang in Berkeley Square, which is a song that came out, interestingly, during World War II. So I imagine they probably would have heard that for the first time, maybe in 1941, which I think is very, very, you know, interesting and sweet. But, you know, deeper than that, you have the connection of the Nightingale and the Lark. And, you know, one of them says their love in the dark and one of them says their love in the you know, light. And it made me think, who of these two, because of course, you know, you've got these contrasting ideas, the nightingale and the lark is kind of like um, something that comes up in Shakespeare a lot, which is very interesting, because of course, it's that Shakespeare connection for them again. But I kind of wondered, who of the two of them would you consider the nightingale and the lark? I think it would be obvious to say that being a demon, uh, Crowley would be the nightingale because, you know, he's very much about the dark and the nighttime and all of that. 
But when you actually stop to think about it, and you actually stop to think about the reality of their kind of moments where Aziraphale realizes he's in love and has that kind of moment of being able to show that, that happens to be in 1941, and it happens to be in the dead of night. So I would argue, and I would posit, that of the two of them, Crowley is actually the lark, and Aziraphale is the nightingale. Because when Crowley actually comes out and makes his love confession and says to Aziraphale, I want to spend the rest of my life with you, that is during the day. So he is therefore the lark, saying how he feels out loud, in, you know, visibly in the light. Aziraphale never says it back. Why do you hurt me like this? But someone has pointed out that in the Bentley, when Crowley gets into the Bentley, the song A Nightingale Sang in Berkeley Square is playing in the Bentley when he first turns it on. And someone pointed out there's a good chance that that song was playing because Aziraphale put it on. And I would be willing to bet you, because if you think about it, if that's the case, Crowley is in the darkness of his Bentley when Aziraphale is able to kind of put that information out there. Because if that's true, if if Aziraphale is the reason that song came on, that suggests to me that he is saying it and that just kind of proves my point that he is the nightingale saying it in the cover of night because he knows he can't say it, you know, where potentially angels could see him because I think one kind of assumes like obviously angels represent the daytime and demons represent the nighttime and darkness and all of that and so if you take that metaphor even more the nighttime would be the only time Aziraphale could say it because that's the time he wouldn't expect angels to be watching over him necessarily. I mean he hasn't said his love yet but if we take it to where we can see it seems very obvious to me that his you know Feelings for Crowley are very much still in the dark. He's not able to say them out loud in the bright morning light yet because he's terrified of what's going to happen. And I do know that it seems very obvious that what he's the most afraid of is what would happen to Crowley. And he says this throughout the show. You know, if you go back to season one, it's the conversation about what happens if hell finds out. It's never the conversation about what happens if hell, uh, heaven finds out. It's always Aziraphale concerned about what would happen to Crowley if hell found out that he was working with an angel. And it's the same thing even in the next scene Crowley is talking about, you know, hell doesn't just write rude notes if, you know, he gets caught assisting an angel. And so all throughout season two, we see these moments of hell being kind of the very real danger that Aziraphale is afraid of. And even in the moment in 1941, you know, when the demon Furfur is trying to out them, it's very much hell and what risk hell represents to Crowley than it is Aziraphale's concern at all what risk heaven represents to him. And I think that's very interesting because it does kind of prove in that way that Aziraphale does care very, very deeply for Crowley and he's very, very concerned for him. And I think it's made him keep his feelings under wraps and it leads, it does lead me to think that, you know, there must have been a threat that the Metatron made against Crowley. You know, there must have been something that he said that we didn't see. You know, obviously when we talk about Shakespeare and Romeo and Juliet, you know, you can't talk about Shakespeare without talking about the idea of like the star-crossed lovers, which I think he popularized, I would argue. But I think that's also kind of a thing in Jane Austen as well, this idea of these two, you know, forbidden lovers. And that is, you know, basically all of what Good Omens is, this idea of these two people, these two beings who are very clearly star-crossed lovers. You know, we see them in the beginning of time where Crowley is making stars and Aziraphale assists him making those stars. Uh, Crowley protects him from a falling meteor shower. And it's this very, like, it, it kind of feels like that moment is actually more of a metaphor than anything else. Like, yes, it's very cute. It's very sweet. You know, it, it shows that Aziraphale clearly was in love with him from before the beginning. But I also think 
it's kind of a metaphor of the idea of the star cross lovers because they're literally Crowley is creating the stars, but also they can't, you know, because of his fall, they can't be together. It's forbidden. It's this, you know, great temptation as it were. And I just think that's very, very interesting. And of course, you know, when you get into the Shakespeare at all of it all, and you get into the Romeo and Juliet and you get into the Jane Austen and those forbidden love stories and how that is yet another metaphor of their love, we already kind of know because everyone knows the idea of Shakespeare. I think even if you don't know Shakespeare, you know Shakespeare because it's just so ingrained into our collective psyche, as it were. There's not a way to like not know Shakespeare, even if you don't, even if you've never read it, you like have seen something of it. I also had kind of some thoughts about the theme of devotion, which comes up a lot in this series. I think there is something to be said about the very obvious devotion that Crowley and Aziraphale have for each other and the very obvious love that they have for each other. You know, in the beginning of season two, Crowley says he wouldn't be a bookseller at gunpoint. But then when Aziraphale says, hey, would you watch the shop for me while I go to Edinburgh to research this and, you know, take care of Gabriel, he does it. And though he doesn't sell books and he does exactly what you know, Aziraphale wants, he is very much devoted enough that he will do that, even though he said no. You know, he shared his car because he's devoted enough and cares enough that he's willing to do that, even though he kind of hates it, you know? And of course he rescues Aziraphale constantly. You know, he's willing to step foot in a church, which I think is kind of the greatest act of devotion and sacrifice because he knows what it could do to him and he knows how badly it can hurt him and yet he does it anyway. I kind of wish we had gotten a scene in which, you know, Aziraphale kind of gets to take care of him after that because you know he was like singed all fuck. Like, you know, we, maybe season three, who knows? So there's all these kind of moments of like, devotional things, these devotional acts, especially, you know, in that scene in 1941, because in walking through that holy place, Crowley is saying, I would walk through fire for you, literally for him. And then, you know, there's that second act of devotion in the end of season one, in which Crowley literally walks through hellfire again for Aziraphale and protects him in heaven. And, you know, Aziraphale does the same thing, taking holy water for him, for Crowley in, you know, that end, end of season one. So it's this moment of like, clearly they are very, very devoted to each other. They're very, very, you know, I think arguably in love. And I just, it's so beautiful and so heartwarming. And I just, I need season three to be here soon, but I also need it to end on a happy note. So yeah, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts of any of the themes or symbols that I've already explored or any of the themes and symbols that I didn't explore that you hope that I would get to that maybe you want to hear me talk about. Obviously, like I said, I do have content through till you know, March, but I'm always willing to move things back or even push them aside for another video. If there's something you want to hear more about or you want to hear about instead, I am always open to suggestion. I always love to hear what you guys want to see, uh, what you want to see more of, what you want to hear me talk about. So if ever you have an idea or a suggestion, please leave it in the comments. I am so eager to hear them. I just, I love making Good Omens content and I love, you know, talking about this and thinking about this and making these notes and all of these things. So if you would like to see more, please, please subscribe to this channel, like this video. It of course helps the algorithm. Comment down below, as I said. Um, you can also join me on Patreon where I am making special Patreon only videos. Those are going to be mostly behind the scenes, but also going to include specific topics that are just Patreon only, maybe non Good Omen stuff, who knows? But yeah, and you can join me there at patreon.com slash Narcissa Deville for a modest fee. And until next time, stay devilish and see you next Tuesday.